Honourable Minister of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Suresh Prabhakar Prabhu, Mr. Shyam Bhartia, Mr. Hari Bhartia, Ms. Shurin Ban, Excellencies, and our dear friends from India. A warm welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. We are here to put a spotlight on social innovation in India and to celebrate three examples of leading social enterprises in the country, our finalists from this year's Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award. For us at the World Economic Forum and the Schwab Foundation, social entrepreneurs are a special community. They are pioneers tackling some of the great societal challenges of our age. They inspire us through their vision, innovations, and business models to serve communities that are often marginalized or disadvantaged in our society. The theme of the India Economic Summit this year is creating Indian narratives on global challenges. In that spirit, I am proud to say that social entrepreneurs in India have been leading the way in the field, not just in India, but on the global stage. And the Schwab Foundation has been honored to elevate their stories through our platform. Beyond their direct impacts, Social entrepreneurs also represent a powerful idea, an idea that is relevant today more than ever before, that business approaches can not only create economic value, but also make a significant contribution to building a fair and equitable society. India's corporate champions, many of whom are here in this room, can be powerful allies in helping the social entrepreneurs scale these innovations broaden their reach and deepen their impact. In addition, the support of government at the national and state levels is essential in fostering social innovation and scaling it. We are especially delighted to have the presence of the Honorable Minister and many other so dedicated government leaders with us tonight. The three finalists that you will meet today are tackling issues of utmost importance in the education ecosystem in India today. Madhupani Tasa of the Akshaya Patra Foundation is doing incredible work to make sure that every child who goes to school is not studying on an empty stomach. Safina Hussain of Educate Girls is helping to boost school enrollment of girls in underprivileged areas by engaging members of their local communities. And Urvashi Shani from Study Hall Educational Foundation is pioneering new methods of feminist pedagogy in schools to boost the confidence and leadership skills of girls. Through innovations in process, technology, and social science, these finalists are having meaningful and sustainable impact at significant scale and changing the lives of countless Indians. Entrepreneurs like them are the reason why the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship is very proud to partner with the Jubilant Bhartia Foundation in presenting the Social Entrepreneur of the Year India Award every year. Let me now invite Mr. Shyam Bhartia, Chairman of the Jubilant Bhartia Group, to share more about the importance of this gathering and our three finalists. Thank you. Honorable Subesh Prabhakar Prabhuji, Minister for Commerce and Industry, Hilde, Shireen, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award for 2017. On my behalf and the behalf of the Jubilant Bhartiya Group, I would like to thank you all for being with us today. It gives me an immense pleasure to specially welcome our chief guest, Sri Suresh Prabhu, Minister for Commerce and Industry. An exemplary person with several feathers in his cap, Sri Prabhu 
has won the hearts with his innovative and forward mindset. He changed the perception of the people about Indian Railways from reactive to proactive functioning agency. As a railway minister, he initiated major reforms bringing improvement in governance system, financial situation, customer satisfaction, cleanliness, information technology, and energy efficiency and use of renewables. Mr. Prabhu's innovative model on development, the Parivartan Kendras or transformation centers for villagers of his constituency, aims at providing economic opportunities and sustainable livelihood to each and every villager at his, at his place of residence and also work on development aspects of health and environment. He is associated with many social and charitable organizations. As a Minister for Commerce and Industry, Mr. Prabhu has hit the ground running. Just one month into his new role, he has already taken a number of initiatives and has traveled all over the world promoting India and Make in India. We are delighted to have Mr. Suresh Prabhu today at this Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award ceremony. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for being with us today. A very special welcome to Klaus and Hilde, who are deeply involved in the global recognition of the social entrepreneurs in their vision to engage with different communities, especially social entrepreneurs, via a vibrant global platform for them to meet, share, and learn from each other. Thank you, Hilde. It has been a great pleasure and honor to work with you over the last eight years in recognizing social entrepreneurs in India. Jubilant Bhartiya Foundation, established by Jubilant Bhartiya Group, is a not-for-profit organization, conceptualized and implements corporate social responsibility for the group and others in the area of primary schooling in rural areas, provision for basic health care, vocational training, promoting social enterprises in India. We have also taken new initiatives towards innovation in social development projects and new projects to promote digital India. In last eight years, we have received over 1,300 applications and witnessed that boundaries of the application are expanding in terms of sectors like healthcare, environment, water, and sanitation. The Swap Foundation, has a stringent selection process and provides vast exposure to social entrepreneurs through their participation in various global events, and especially, in it, especially at its annual general meeting in Davos, China, and various regional meetings. For this year's award, the overwhelming response, uh, there was an overwhelming response, and the qualities of the applications were very competitive. Out of the 100 applications, 14 entrepreneurs were shortlisted, followed by five for diligence list and narrowing down to three finalists. I would like to extend my warm welcome to all the three finalists. Madhu Pandit Dasa, the Akshay Patra Foundation, Bengaluru, Safina Hussain, Educate Girls, Mumbai, Urvashi Sahani, Study Hall Education Foundation, Lucknow. We look forward in collaborating and supporting all of you with linkages and network to increase our impact and scale. I now invite Shireen to tell the stories of the three finalists. Honorable Commerce Minister, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, Mrs. Schwab, uh, Sham, and Hari Bhartia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for joining us here on a very special occasion. It is a very proud moment for us here at CNBC TV 18 because today actually marks the 11th anniversary of our association with the Schwab Foundation as well as the World Economic Forum uh, to bring to you the India Social Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. This is also our eighth year of partnering with the Jubilant Bharatiya Foundation, so thank you very much for continuing this association. Uh, I still remember very vividly, I think it was 2006 that I watched Vikram Akula being honored with the Social Entrepreneur Award for making India sit up and take notice of the microfinance model. Vikram has since moved on, SKS has changed as well, but the idea that social enterprises can be scalable, sustainable, and I dare say profitable has gained currency. 
The women and men that we've honored over the years have taught us that entrepreneurship is not just a race to a number, but a race to a result with the objective of creating a fair, equitable, and inclusive society. Today, as a nation, we should be very proud of the fact that we are one of the fastest growing economies in the world, but we should not be lulled into a sense of complacency because there is so much that needs our attention and our intervention. Inequality remains persistent, our public health care system is broken, participation of women in the workforce is declining, and our infrastructure deficit continues to widen. These challenges are also opportunities, and a lot of the entrepreneurs here in this room and over the past several years have ensured that they haven't remained a prisoner of their circumstances and have in fact delivered on each of these challenges. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to our finalists here this evening, our first finalist today. If you've ever wondered what could be the possible drivers to push underprivileged children towards education, then some of the obvious responses could be basic awareness, exposure to opportunities, and the desire for a better future. But what if we told you that one of the key drivers in this mission could in fact be a midday meal? That's right, and several surveys and research also suggest that midday meals help bring underprivileged children to school, particularly girls. Reports also indicate that midday meals can lead to not just an increase in retention, learning ability, and greater social equity. That is the power of one meal, and amongst us is a not-for-profit that identified this driver way back in the year 2000. Let's take a look at how Akshay Patra Foundation is slowly educating the country and conquering hunger one meal at a time. There are different kinds of iniquities, which is a fact of life. But the iniquity of opportunities for some children to get educated, hunger-free, while other children sit in the classrooms hungry, this is totally unacceptable to Akshay Patra. Born in Trivandrum in 1956, Madhu Pandit Dasa was inspired by the teachings of Srila Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of ISKCON that established a kitchen to provide food to the hungry. But Dasa's entrepreneurial journey began when the then CFO of Infosys, Mohan Das Pai, walked into his office and appreciated the temple's efforts. He then inquired if it was possible to use the existing infrastructure of ISKCON kitchen and prepare food for children of a nearby government school. That seeded the idea of the Akshay Patra Foundation which started by feeding 1,500 children from five schools in Bengaluru. Today, the foundation has expanded its reach to over 16 lakh children across 12 states in India. Working in a public-private partnership, the cost of each meal is provided by the government, while the deficit amount is raised from corporate organizations and individual donors. The working model is simple. The foundation works out of 31 centralized kitchens and two decentralized kitchens which supply meals to schools in the neighborhood. So the very first kitchen that we designed, we used steam cooking to see that the food is not touched by any human beings. So this was actually solved by steam cooking and also to maintain the quality of taste. We have a standard operating procedure for every menu that we, we have uh, designed in such a way that there's no need for a cook in the entire Akshay Patra process. People are taught skills, how to mix the ingredients in the right quantity, at the right temperature, at the right stage of the cooking, so we have a standard taste coming out of this food. Today, these kitchens have become an employment and training hub for women from rural India. By taking them on board, the foundation encourages them to improve their lifestyle and teaches them to feed their self-esteem while feeding others. But it isn't just human power that makes things work. Like all other industries, Technology clearly has a major role to play at Akshay Patra and it's not restricted to meal preparation. To ensure efficient logistics, all of Akshay Patra's vehicles house a GPS technology and the meal machines are tracked by the team during deliveries. 
The foundation claims that the rate of failure of delivering meals on time is as low as 0.2%. But while Madhu Pandit Dasa was busy staffing and equipping tech in operations, the kids brought him back to basics. When we went from South India to North India, in South India we, our menu was rice-based menu, and we simply repeated it in the North. But after a week, the children refused to eat it. So that's when we learned that we have to cater to the local palate. In spite of being hungry, they didn't want to take it. That's when Akshay Patra took up the challenge of uh, designing a chapati making machine. In those days, the, the machine that we found was of 2,000 chapatis per hour, which was nothing. And we were feeding 50,000 children in, 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 the, in Vrindavan, which means even two chapatis means we need a lack of chapatis a day. So that's when we, uh, we got into R&D and we developed a machine. Today, we have machines that make 40,000 chapatis per hour. Innovation was not restricted by local kitchens. To increase access and play a role in disaster relief, the foundation has launched Kitchen on Wheels. This has been specifically designed to provide assistance in times of disaster and natural calamities. As part of this social commitment, Akshay Patra contributed to the relief plans during the Nepal earthquake and the floods in Chennai. Apart from uh, increasing the number of beneficiaries in different states and more and more partnership with you know, states which have not yet partnered, um, we, we would uh, like to train other NGOs uh, so that they can also come up uh, to help the, uh, the project. I mean, the project is taken up by the government of India and the state government since the year 2002 to feed 110 million children in the government schools. It's a humongous task. So, I mean, Akshay Patra can be a model. The road ahead involves setting up new kitchens in states where they're currently operating and also extending services to new states. Akshay Patra's big mission is to reach and feed 5 million children every single day by 2020. Change Agents, Social Entrepreneur of the Year 2017, powered by Young Turks. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the Akshay Patra Foundation. May I request our guests to do the honors and may I request Mr. Madhu Pandit Dasa to please come up on stage, sir. Keep the applause going, ladies and gentlemen. It deserves, it deserves every bit of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Dasa, and congratulations to the Akshay Patra Foundation. Our next social entrepreneur this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is also on a mission, a mission to get India's girls into classrooms. Safina Hussain has sent over two lakh girls across different parts of rural India back to school. Her NGO, Educate Girls, tries to address the issue of gender inequality in India's educational system. Educate Girls believes in a model of community ownership which has helped improve enrollment and attendance of girls in classrooms. Let's take a look at the Educate Girls story. <laughs> You know, I was in a village recently and I met a girl, her name was Naraznath. Cool. And she's named Naraznath because everybody was so angry when a girl was born. I met another girl, her name is Antim Bala, because everybody hoped that that would be the last girl who would be born. I want to become a police officer. I want to become a teacher. One of our Team Balika volunteers who really struggled against all the odds and is now teaching, her name is Achuki, the one who has already arrived. Not wanted, but has arrived. 
this is what I hope we will be rid of in 10 years or at least in my lifetime. And Safina who says weapon in this battle is education, specifically education of our girls. Post her studies from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, Safina Hussein worked extensively with rural and urban underserved communities in South America, Africa and Asia. It was after 10 years of grassroots community work that Safina returned to India and in 2007 started Educate Girls. Leveraging existing community and government resources for girls' education, Educate Girls today covers 21,000 schools across 15 districts of Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh and works with 2 million children. Not just enrollment and retention, the venture is also focused on improving the learning cycle of every child in educationally backward districts and has positively impacted the learning outcomes of 6.5 lakh children today. But the start wasn't easy. We would get a lot of backlash. Um, if we asked women to speak in the meetings, the men would walk away saying, Inki himmat kaise hui hamare saamne baat karne ki. Um, when we would go door to door for our survey, um, we usually do the survey just before the school year starts, so it's in the peak of summer. So then they'd be like, you know, they'd call you mad dogs, people would chase you out, people would say, Dham pagal kutte hai jo itni garbi mein ghar ghar jate hai ladkiyon ko dhundne ke liye. So there was a lot of pushback and, and very difficult from a community level. But it got easier over time. As we got better, we kind of realized what are the strategies to use and what not to do. And one of the strategies that worked for Educate Girls was to facilitate community ownership through Team Balika. Educate Girls has over 10,000 Team Balika or community volunteers who work as champions for girls' education. Team Balika not only helps identify out-of-school girls in their villages, but also helps bring these girls back to school. The NGO trains its Team Balika volunteers to implement creative learning curriculum using its teaching kits or Gyan Kapitara. Having enrolled 2 lakh school girls to date, generating revenue still is a challenge. Our model is very grant-based. You know, there is there are very limited sources of revenue when parents are not willing to send a girl to a free government school, there is not much, you know, they're not going to spend anything on her. In any case, in most areas, uh, you know, your goat is an asset and your girl is a liability. So that's the framework that we're working in. So it's very hard to make an income generating model out of girls' education. Um, so everything is grant-based, donation-based. However, we have piloted a, a, an innovative financial tool which is a development impact bond, a payment for results mechanism, which can actually create more sustainability in terms of uh, resources. A first of its kind development impact bond in education across the world, Safina tells us that this innovative tool not only has the potential to bring in new revenues, but also ties money to pure impact. Working only in rural, remote and tribal areas, Educate Girls has shown tremendous growth. The organization has scaled from 15 to a team of 1,400 full-time employees, from 50 schools to over 21,000 schools, and today impacts 4.9 million individuals. Safina also claims that the Educate Girls result-based model is not only scalable and replicable, but is also low-cost and highly evidence-based. Our hope is, you know, uh, that in, in five years we're working with 5 million children annually. So that is our own internal ambition, is to grow and scale to that level. But my bigger ambition is that, you know, we get to an India where sons and daughters are equal. So there doesn't need to be an educate girl, where a girl is valued as much as a boy. Safina's focus for 2018 will also be to scale to more districts and to reach over 2.5 million children. Moreover, it is also now in the third year of the three-year development impact bond pilot project and is on course to achieve the deliverables promised. The organization's focus to bring systemic reforms is what will perhaps help bring India's three million out-of-school girls back to school.
change agents. Social Entrepreneur of the Year 2017, powered by Young Turks. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to Safina Hussain and Educate Girls. Can we have you up on stage, please? Congratulations and more power to you, Safina. And we're down to our final finalist this evening, Urvashi Shani, the founder of Study Hall Educational Foundation. Urvashi and her team have been working towards providing quality education to girls at risk, disadvantaged children, and the differently abled for the past 31 years. Under SHEF, Urvashi has established three K-12 schools that directly provide education to over 4,000 students. With an eye on scaling up, SHEF has partnered with 993 government schools in states of Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan. In the last three decades, study halls programs have impacted the lives of more than 500,000 girls. Here's a look at Urvashi Shani's story. The reason for starting it really was a discontent with education and actually my own education. I felt that I'd been gone to a very good school, St. Mary's in Pune, which was considered one of the best in the country at the time. And I did very well. And I was married off very soon after. I was just 18 when I was married. And pondering on that, I really looked at my education and felt that uh, it uh, didn't deal with any existential questions and it didn't really teach me how to live and to face some of the challenges I had. I started a women's organization called Suraksha, which is still alive and kicking. This was in 1983. And what led to the forming of that was my own cousin, who had gone to a school like mine, she had, she burnt herself. She was in Delhi, married to a chartered accountant. And the shock of that, that an educated girl from a background can, like mine could do that or have it done to her, we don't know exactly which one. Well, how did her education serve her? She had a bachelor's degree. Very soon into it, I understood that, you know, a standard academic education was not going to empower girls. It hadn't empowered me. I couldn't stop my very early marriage. It didn't empower my cousin. She couldn't face the circumstances, the gendered circumstances that she had to. And it doesn't empower many, many, many countless other educated women. So definitely the pedagogy had to be different and what we had, the whole approach had to be different. This is how Urvashi Shani's quest to build study hall began. A school system aimed to answer the existential questions that children face. What started in her garage in Lucknow in 1994 with a handful of students is today an amalgamation of schools, digital learning centers, teacher education programs and partnership with state governments of Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan that has impacted the lives of lakhs of youth. And through this journey, the pillar of the Study Hall Education Foundation has been its unique pedagogy based on critical dialogues. At Prerna, which is our school for girls, uh, very early, almost a year or two into the school. There was high absenteeism, there were dropouts, and we were struggling. When I sat down with a bunch of girls who had dropped out from school and had rejoined Prerna because it was in the afternoon and because the fee was only 10 rupees, which was really a commitment fee. And I sat down and started to talk to them, not about uh, education, but about their lives. And what I found that in these dialogues, which we call critical dialogues, uh, the girls were not only dis telling their stories, but in the telling of their stories, they were finding a new understanding of themselves, a new almost construction of themselves. And in that, collectively, as we were listening to each other's stories, we were building a new sense of who we were as equal people. So it was in these informal dialogues, so to speak, though they were during school hours, that I realized that this was a very, very important way, direction in which our education of girls should, that education of girls should go. 
and then we formalized it and put it as part of the official curriculum once a week for one hour at least and normally it ran to much more than that during the school day we would engage in these critical dialogues in terms of measuring impact across all the cohorts that have graduated till now 97% of the girls have transitioned to higher education and 52% of the graduates are today employed Interestingly, three years ago, the group founded the Prerna Boys School with 150 boys from very low-income backgrounds with the goal of helping them develop a feminist consciousness as well. And it was to the same end that Study Hall established the Vidya Stali School, an affordable co-educational school in Malihabad village, 32 kilometers away from Lucknow in 2005. The school presently educates over 500 children from 55 villages and the mission here is to encourage children to critically examine the prevalence of caste and gender-based discrimination as well as focus on rural development. So while the pedagogy at all study hall institutions involves students playing an active role in their own education, the role of the teacher as a pillar of support within the classroom and outside cannot be dismissed. In fact, back in 2005, at a time when video technology and the internet weren't ubiquitous, Urvashi Shani started the Digital Study Hall program to improve the quality of classroom teaching. We put in place a very simple idea that we were videoing good classes and then we distributed these by putting into place a mediation pedagogy, which means that at the user end, the teacher is not just supposed to show the video to the children, but she serves like a co-teacher, she pauses and she emulates what she sees in the video. We only have 2,000 videos and more and we are serving a very large number of schools. We have put it online which is free of cost and we have over 2 lakhs of uh, visitors to our site who are using the videos. And very recently we've been invited by the national teacher platform Diksha which you must have heard just got launched recently and all our videos will be taken up by them to be used by teachers everywhere in the country. Study Hall also manages 16 nurturing education centres in very low income neighbourhoods in and around Lucknow to help children who are currently out of school transition into formal schooling. Study Hall was also one of the first schools in Lucknow to have an integrated programme called Dosti for children with special needs. Today it imparts education to more than 100 physically and mentally challenged children across the age groups of 6 to 21. We scale in terms of going school by school by school and we engage with uh, over a thousand schools now which includes means over a hundred thousand students really. And we want to do it online using technology and that is of course the numbers multiply enormously by that. We want to do it by approaching teacher training. We have set up our own college, that's our latest venture and we want to have a very strong teacher training college uh, there and we want to influence other teacher training practices. And most importantly, we want to work with government so that we can influence the government school system because I believe that it is actually the government's mandate to educate its millions of children. The private sector should, it should only be supplementary. Change Agents, Social Entrepreneur of the Year 2017, powered by Young Turks. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Urvishi Shani, Study Hall Educational Foundation. And with that, uh, we bring the storytelling to a close. But if you do want to know more about their stories, then do tune into CNBC TV 18 tonight at 10.30 p.m. We have their stories being told for you again. Hilde Schwab with the winner. Thank you. Pretty amazing social entrepreneurs who made the job of the jury 
really, really difficult. And at this moment, I would like to acknowledge uh, the work of the members of the jury and thank them for their engagement. So, the winner of the Social Entrepreneur of the Year India 2017 is Ms. Urvashi Sani. <laughs> So congratulations, please, please stay. Please, would you share a few words with us? Please. <laughs> I'm still reeling, but uh, thank you very much uh, to the Schwab Jubilant Bhartiya Foundation for this amazing opportunity. But first of all, let me tell you that I feel really very undeserving compared to the my other co-finalists, and I would like to congratulate them, and I wish they would be here right here with me. Uh, to be on the same panel as Akshay Patra and Educate Girls was honor enough. To be here, I feel very humbled, and thank you very much. I would also like to uh, point my team is here, all the way from Lucknow, from Didi's, from Predna, and my daughter. I want to... Uh, the award, really, thank you so much for it. It comes to our entire organization, to all our Prerna girls, all our Prerna teachers, and I can't tell you how they will be cheering for this. Uh, I, you asked me to say a few words, and I've probably run out of many of them already, but I do want to say this from a chef, from my Prerna girls, that uh, you know, gender discrimination is lethal. It has lethal consequences. India has now become, and I say this with great shame, the rape capital of the world. We, in India, girls are not safe in the womb. We have over 500,000 female infanticide per year. They're not safe on the streets. They're not safe at home. And they're unwanted, unsafe, unequal. And for how long will we let this continue? We keep saying every time there is a, there's a tragedy, we talk about changing mindsets, and yet we don't recognize the most potent force of changing mindsets is education. And we keep talking about quality education without realizing that we need to look at quality education better to define it again. If it is important to learn math, science, read and write, why is it not equally important to learn to think of yourself as an equal person, to reflect critically, as an, intellect, as an intellectual mode on things like caste, on gender, on communalism, that we need to deepen and widen the definition of quality in which we do in our schools. And I hope we, the government, we can work very closely with the government to do that with all your help. I just want to tell you the story of one of our students, Lakshmi. And to talk about, when we talk about how education can change lives, this child is 13. She was 13 when her mother died. She was working in seven homes. She had five brothers and sisters, and her, her father was an alcoholic, so there was no support at all. She found our school and came because it was in the afternoon, and she could spend the ten minutes because she could work in the morning and support her family, and brought her children with us. If we had not worked at helping her think of herself as an equal person, she might not still be there today, and today she is doing her MBA. She's earning 27,000 rupees. All the sisters are in school, one of them finishing college. <laughs> to repeat one more anecdote that I was training male principals in Rajasthan. 
71 schools, 71 principals, all men, co-ed schools. And so I asked him, in the, you know, it's much harder to work with people who have privilege and have them give up their privilege. So I was, one of them came with me, which is the most heartening thing at lunchtime. And he said, you know, ma'am, aaj mujhe samaj mein aaya ki mein samajta tha ki ye gender ki baat hoti rehti hai, ye jase khansi tukam ki baat ko leke they make such a big deal out of it. But ab mujhe samaj mein aaya, it is like cancer. Or is it bhaat dhyan dena chahiye? Can't tell you how I rejoice. And I want to bring his voice here again, that really, you know, we, if education is a very strong, very powerful transformative force. But if we want it to do its job, then we must transform education. We must transform pedagogies, we must transform curricula, and we must give it the power that it should have. We have narrowed it down to reading, writing, maths, exams, and careers. And now we want to further narrow it down to skill development. Please, let's not do that. Education should be broader, deeper, wider, and it should help us learn to be democratic citizens. We will not achieve full democracy unless we do that. I think exhausted my quota of words, but thank you very much once again. And I must say that I want to once again congratulate Akshay Patra and Educate Girls, and I think they deserve this as much as me, perhaps more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Urvashi. We love your passion and compassion. Let me now ask Minister Prabhu to address us, please. Good evening, friends. What a wonderful function. I'm sure all of you are enjoying the evening because you could just hear one of them, but you could see the work of three of them, the work which has really tried to change the lives of so many people. And there is one very interestingly, though three different activities, three different individuals, three different institutions, but a common thread is only one, and that's education. And one single thing, how much it can change the lives of people. So I really wish to congratulate each one of you for doing such a splendid work and in the process, helping so many people to realize their own dreams. I also wish to congratulate the organizers and particularly Hilde for thinking about instituting an award of this kind. And of course, thanking both Sham and Hari for instituting an award to make it happen. And of course, I can't I mention everybody and not to mention Shirin, being in politics, being in TV business, not to mention them is inviting trouble. So thank you for this, doing this. It's a very interesting that this is happening at a time of annual World Economic Forum functions. When all the top leaders of industry, business, come here, debate, talk to each other, interact, and the presumption is they try to find out how can they further their business more so that they can make more money, which is presumed to bring in more happiness. And of course, I'm a strong proponent, and also being an industry and commerce minister, that's my job. So people ask me, what is your job as a commerce industry minister? I said, my business is to let people do their business. And I'll be happy if they make not only business, but make business with profit. So they are earning more money, I can earn happiness. So that's my job. But at a time when people are meeting for that, primary purpose, to have an award like this, which is to promote, recognize, and reward social entrepreneurs, which is actually, normally we'll believe that why social entrepreneurs should be there to begin with. If all the problems 
of the society can be solved by the business or by the government, and I hope they do that, then there is really no need for social entrepreneurs to come in. But they normally step in when we recognize the gap that exists, the vacuum that is created, because of inability of both institutions, the business and the government, to take care of all the social needs. Even if you provide classrooms, not necessarily education follows. Even if there are classrooms, there are teachers, there are everything available, still there is something more we just you mentioned, and that is the huge need for education itself to reinvent and to find out how it can meet the needs of the people. And therefore, social entrepreneurs are needed. They don't make profit, but they definitely earn the goodwill. And they don't reward the shareholders, but they definitely make societies happier. And therefore, the need for social entrepreneurship is far, far greater. At a time when we are creating new institutions, a time to make, meet with several new challenges, we really need such kind of individuals who are really motivated. And I know entrepreneurs normally take risk, and therefore they say the reward is inevitable because risk and reward relationship is well known. But probably in this, they don't take risk, but they plunge into a problem and try to offer themselves as a complete offering as we do it to the God and say that this is what I am giving it completely, totally, and that's why I should help, I should get what I really need to do out of my effort. Education is, as you mentioned, something very interesting and very interesting part of these three awardees is that they are dealing with different aspects, but it's the same commitment. In fact, sometimes we wonder, why, what is the difference? Because we are running midday meals program for a long time. When my good friend Jyotiratha Sindhya has been in the government before that and after that, we are running it for a long time. But what has made a difference is the commitment that you come in. And a commitment makes the difference. The same food is cooked everywhere. Why some food tastes better? What is the reason? Very interestingly, there was one jail, all the inmates were doing very well, so jailer was a very happy man. Because they are behaving as if they are not in the jail, but they are in some institution like religious institution where they are behaving so well. And he used to always tell with pride that, look at my inmates, they are so disciplined, they are doing everything that is even normal people outside the jail will not do. And suddenly he gets a rude shock. He wakes up in the morning to find out there is a lot of commotion in the jail. Everybody is trying to hit each other. There's a lot of violence. So he starts finding out what must have gone wrong. The same people, same environment, suddenly, overnight, what has changed? So he starts looking into the situation he appoints, does not appoint an inquiry committee, but he looks into the situation and then discovers that everything is same. He keeps asking people, what has changed? There's nothing. Then he comes to the final round, goes to the <coughs> place where the food is cooked, and he discovers that the cook had changed. So he calls the cook, he said, what is that, the same? Why should it change? The ingredients are the same, the same utensils you're using, what is changed? So he does a little bit of, spends time with him, does a session with him, and he discovers that his cook who has just come in, has come from a very unhappy background. He has been very angry within himself. If he, has, if he feels that society has been very unjust, so every time he's cooking the food, he's thinking about that and thinking, I am going to kill this man very soon and doing that. So end of the day, the meal that he cooks also get the same feeling. And if you really look at it, it is not just a story. But why is the home-cooked food is better than what you get in the best of the places? Of course, that may be better. But why do you get it like this? <laughs> and therefore, the reason is obvious that a commitment with which the mother cooks food for the child, the sister makes it for the brother, or the wife makes it for the husband, that makes the difference. Because she comes and with emotions and she makes the food. So what is the difference between Akshay Patra and the other midday meal scheme? The difference is you are doing 
with a devotion and you are thinking that akshay patra is lord krishna give it to somebody or you are trying to do it and that's makes the difference so why is the social entrepreneurs are doing a better job is because they come with this commitment which makes the difference otherwise rest of things are the same the same type of food same ingredients because i think there must be a protocol how you must make the food everything but you have met the chain the same with the education institution there are so many schools in the country but you decided to make the change and you decided that i am going to do it because i want the child not just to be coming to the school but must leave the school as a much better person a whole personality to be developed and that's what makes the change so this is something that's why we really need to recognize social entrepreneurs who come with this commitment passion dedication sincerity which really brings the end product completely different then what a normal process will bring it out and therefore i really wish to congratulate you and i'm sure you will continue to do this good work but only commitment will take you some far but not beyond what is also important here is a extensive use of technology and that is something which is very interesting and that's what i think you organize this event alongside our world economic forum because those all the bajajis and others and many of these industrialists who are present here will bring in technology which they use in the shop floor to make profit but at the same technology can be used and leverage with the commitment that you have can transform societies and that is why bringing technology with commitment and passion is a sure recipe for a social change that we are all looking for so i think i am really very very happy and i'm very excited about the fact that i know the jury must be having a very tough time because they selected three and to choose one from three was the most odious task so i must congratulate them first for doing that but there will be so many such great individuals and institutions who are working around the country around the world here this is an india award i'm sure we will be finding so many such great institutions and individuals around the world they are doing something which is really going to make a real change in the lives of people and that is what is really we are all looking for because changing life is far more important than doing something else and therefore facilitating it enabling it to happen is something which is a great achievement i am really happy that i could be here and something a politician always feel that i must do something good but if you cannot do that the second best that you can do is to give award to good people so thank you very much and congratulations to you before i propose my vote of thanks my my congratulations to the winner urvashi ji obviously and of course our finalist madhu pandita ji safina ji you know every time <clears throat> uh for the last 8 years that when i come to this function it's a great reminder to us we call ourselves as business entrepreneurs but the amount of passion and an impact that i see from the kind of work that you guys do with so little resources is amazing it's always a great learning is always a great reminder because we are in our own world of quarterly results and uh, making profits but sometimes uh, we need a very strong reminder that there is a, a large social impact that needs to be made if even our own business has to be sustainable so thank you for this uh, this amazing work and uh, and i see the challenge for the jury really to see choose the best winner they are amazing all all three of our finalists are such have done such amazing work such large impact in in their areas of course i must thank uh, klaus and hilde for partnering and creating this amazing platform for social entrepreneurs you take them to davos expose them to the world give them 
different opportunities. Uh, really, indeed, thankful. We are honored by this partnership. Thank you, Hilde. Please do convey my regards to Klaus. Of course, to our jury members for, for their time and effort, our partners, HT Media, CNBC 18, uh, Shireen, you have been with us, like you said, 18, 11 years now, eight years with us. Thank you for, for being such an amazing partner. Uh, I would like to thank Manisha Gupta of Startup for doing all the work. Manisha, please stand up. Thank you. And, and Ravi Kanaria of Shop Foundation. Ravi. And from our Jubilant Bharatiya team, Vivek Prakash and uh, Runa Pathak. Thank you. And uh, I, I must not forget that our Master of Ceremonies, Ajay Khanna, who really uh, provides leadership to this whole, to this whole event. And ladies and gentlemen, I must thank Suresh ji. You know, when I reached out to him, I got a response in 12 hours that you will be with us. Thank you. You are, you are really a great friend and for taking out time and, and being with us in this very important function. So a round of applause for our winners and for Suresh ji. Thank you.